Um, can you hear me? Okay, right. Uh, as you can see, uh, this is the famous, uh, infamous, I should say, uh, toilet shower. Okay. Um, you have to keep the lid of your toilet seat down to stop your money from going down the loo. Now, you might think this is funny, but uh, there's actually books written on it to take it very seriously. Maybe that's why China is such a poor country in the past because they don't have an open lid on their open latrine in all the public toilets, you know. Now for years I've been trying to figure out where these ridiculous rules and ideas in feng shui come from, you know. How did they come about, right? Um, and you can see from the written quote in this book in here, some people take it very seriously. Now, in the Western literature on feng shui, right, the term qi is often translated as energy, and we keep bending this word energy and force, right, implying that it's not only a force, but also be able to produce a result. Energy is ability to work, and it's measurable, okay? Now, in this case, uh, the energy or the qi, right, as they say, is being sucked down the toilet, the money will also go down with it, literally. No. But to the Chinese, qi is not the same as energy. And what is not the same as money? Right? The way we define qi uh, in, the, in the Chinese literature, philosophical literature, right? right? Qi is matter and the potential to become while still remain in its material states. So when I look at something, I look at the material of it, and I try to look at the potential what it is. We look at the house, we see all the furniture, the rooms, the roof, the walls and everything. And we look at the chi. We're not looking at any kind of physical energy of the house. We're looking at the potential and tendency of this house going to be and the potential and the tendency of people who move in this house, how they will behave. That's what we talk about qi, right? Now, this is, this is the problem, this kind of misunderstanding uh, of different ways of thinking. And I think it's because many people, right, including quite a few practitioners, right, are not aware there are two modes of thinking we use in feng shui, right? mainly Chinese correlative thinking and Western causal logical thinking. Now, we in actual fact use these two types of thinking together in our feng shui analysis. And the problem is that we jump from side to side. With the flick of finger, one minute I'm thinking correlatively, next minute I think causally. Right? And the Chinese try to express that in the fact that I have two schools of feng shui. They don't have one school of feng shui. Why do you need two schools? Two major schools everybody knows, right? We have the form school feng shui and we have the compass school feng shui. Why do we need two? And that's because they do different things. And essentially, they think differently. Of course, it's not black and white. When you do form feng shui, you do causal thinking, but a little bit of correlating comes in. For instance, I look at the building and I said, oh, this building looked like an animal. I look like a dog or whatever. Now that's using correlated thinking, right now. Uh, we use what we call Ho Jiang, calling out the, the image as a way of expressing our idea. Sometimes it's very difficult to explain a building. It's much better, much easier, much, much better to point using metaphor. And Chinese are aware of that, right now. When we move to compass feng shui, we're mainly using correlated thinking. And the two major school of forms reflect this idea. Everything has qi. Everything that has qi has yin and yang. So even way that we think has a yin and yang way of thinking. There's a yin way of thinking, there's a yang way of thinking. Uh, we observe an appearance, and it makes us think and contemplate what's below, what's behind this that we cannot see. Right? We, we look at a calculation. We create this pattern language, right? And we try to contemplate, and we try to ricochet, 
right, hitting against each other to find the midpoint, find the in-between, find what Confucian talk about, the zhong yong, the golden mean. Now, forms, you look at tangible qi, and the compass school looks at the intangible formless qi, right? Even the Chinese uh, write the, the, the word qi differently. Oh, sorry. Ah, yeah, oh, golly gosh, that doesn't, sorry, yeah, 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 okay. Right. I forgot. Okay, I'll go back in here, right? Okay, I'll go back here. So you can read this, okay? Right? Uh, I'm trying to define clearly what qi is all about, okay? Right? Uh, and also trying to tell you that correlation is not causation. Just because we correlate something, say for instance we correlate five yellow, right, to disaster. It doesn't mean the five yellow is gonna cause us disaster. It's associated with there is potential to create disaster, but it doesn't cause the disaster. But we look at it as though something terrible is gonna happen because the five yellow is there. The five yellow somehow is gonna fly through the window and create disaster for us. Now that's mixing correlative thinking with causal thinking. Oops, sorry. All right. Now, the Chinese even use a different character for form and formless qi. Now, with form qi, they talk about rice and vapor, have physical things. Right? Here, formless qi, they write it as no fire. No fire means you have to calm, you have to contemplate, you have to meditate what's going on. And they use this work here, which in observation, appearance, right? And when they put a heart radical underneath it, they ask you to contemplate, to think, right? So think with feelings, think with logic at the same time. Now that's difficult for us to, you know, grab our head around it. You have to think intellectually and emotionally at the same time. And what they're trying to do is trying to, using the two school to get you to think too differently, and then in the end of it, they ask you to integrate the two integrate your intellect and integrate your emotion. Now, uh, causal thinking tends to reduce the options, right, you see in here, right, we have a problem, oops, sorry, we have a problem and we try to find a solution, find a cause to it, and it, if we eliminate them, Eliminate all the things that doesn't, uh, you know, cause the problem. That's causal thinking. Now, in correlate thinking, uh, we get a compass, right, and we measure the south, and it's correlated with the Lee triagram. And Lee triagram is correlated one thousand one things. So what happened in correlate thinking is that it comes from one to the hundred. That's the kind of structure behind of the two types of thinking, right? So between reduction and enlargement, between appearance and contemplation, between one mode of thinking with another, between using the left and right side of our brain, involving emotion as well as intellect, the Chinese would look for the in-between to find the golden mean, the Confucian Zhongyong, that would give them the appropriate an efficacious answer. Look, I say efficacious, I didn't say efficient. Efficacious means ability to do, achieve what we set out to do. Okay, now a good example, right, of course is the, uh, the yin yang correlation, right? There are many types, I'll just give some example here. There's yin yang, right? And we could literally read uh, uh, the chi of this room using yin and yang. We can look at the substantial, insubstantial of this room. We can look at the light and the dark of this room. We can look at the active and the passive of this room. We can look at the open and closeness of this room. We can look in and look out. Now there's layers and layers of yin and yang. And what we do is that we're using yin yang correlations. We put them in all different layers, sometimes 20, sometimes 30. Right? 
And there are all these different layers of yin and yang. What Chinese do is let them hang there. I don't make a judgment about this room straight away. I just let it hang there. Then I ask myself, what do I want to do in this room? The human qi, the human qi, right? That's a selection for us. If I'm going to turn this room into a dance room, I will organize differently. I will respond to qi in a different way. If I'm going to do it as a, as a lecture room, I'm not going to put myself against the window. That's crazy, my face being black. So I study the yin and yang correlations of this room and then hang them in cloud nine. Then I come along and say, what do you want to do with this room? What kind of atmosphere you want? What sort of function you want in this room? And that's precisely what we do in feng shui. We ask the client, what do you want? What do you want to achieve? Right? And then we compare that right, with the logical thinking and with the correlate thinking. And then we're using the client as a point of reference and give us the appropriate answer. Now, you do this, we do the same thing, right, with the, the classic five elements. You know, the five elements or five face, I really prefer to use the word five face, right? It can be ex expressed in terms of material, shape, and color, and combination of this, right? We can see from the correlation table there are many correlations, and we can put them in categories like orientation, seasons, flavors, colors, and so forth. Okay? And not only we have correlations, we have the relationships, the five phase relationships, the Sankar relationships, right? And with the Sankar relationship, we assign Ji Shung. We assign what is desirable and what is not desirable. Now, there's a translation problem here. You know, people translate Ji Shung as auspicious and harmful, or even worse, is uh, lucky and unlucky. It gives a completely different connotation. Qi in Chinese basically means that's what a learned person will speak of. Shung basically means try not to fall down this hole. Literally, that's what Qi Shung means. But somehow we get translated into lucky, unlucky, auspicious, inauspicious. It gives a whole different kind of coloring to the, to the character. It's not there. Right? Now, in almost all the feng shui schools, everything that we can see or calculate is correlated to the five elements, the five faces. Um, from there, right, we can work out whether this object, this space is desirable or not desirable. It should be used or should be avoided. We do this every time. Whether you're doing fly star, you're doing bajai, right, a houses, right, or you look at the a building, the shape of the building, a hoja. It comes down to five element relationships, right? But you've got to realize even though there are five faces, right? We look at the relationship between two faces at a time. We don't look at them five at a time. We've got them in the background. Sometimes we introduce a third, right? Neutralizing relationship. But basically, you're looking at two things. That's why it's called feng shui. Wind and water, active and passive. Right? We don't call it feng feng. Or we don't call it shui shui, we call it feng shui, wind and water, and not wind wind, because wind wind is active. Shui shui, it's just all water, stationary. We say active and passive, yin and yang, all the time. In Flying Star, right? Okay, what's happened? Okay. In flying star feng shui, right, the sitting and the facing direction, that is the yin and yang side of the house, is measured with the open compass, and its orientation in the A direction is correlated to the A trigrams. You can see, right? In here, oops, everybody knows this, uh, everybody knows this chart, this diagram here. We measure one, right? Say for instance, we measure the, the, uh, uh, the chain, right? Number six, okay? We give the number, uh, we give a, a, a name to the trigram, we give a this indication, creative heaven, right? A attribute, animal, body, family, direction, color, and so forth. These are all correlations, right? As soon as you measure something, right, you get the correlation, okay? Now, 
And then not only have you got the correlation, but the way we are arranging the trigram is this one. And again, the trine is trying to express, right? Life has a perfect, has idealistic component, and that's what they had the early heaven. They want life to be perfect. They want life to be balanced, you know? They want life, life to be idealistic. But we know, right, life is not like that. Life is messy. Life is not artistic, right? Life is full of different problems and different issues, right? Right? So they're trying to find the in-between. That's precisely they do, right? They call it the early heaven the T and the late heaven Jung. And they try to figure out how do you use something? This is the T. Imagine it's a fan. T, my body. This is Jung, function. How can you make this fan, right, work its function in an appropriate way? How can you integrate idealism with materialism? So something is not only looks good, but it's functional. And that's the idea. And we have the Hoto and Loshu, right, arranged in a different way. Again, there's a perfect symmetry, right, and there's also a bit of chaotic, right? Oh, sorry, yes. Uh huh. Okay, what's your diagram? Okay, right. Now, again, the Hoto is considerably T and the, the Lo Shu is considerably Yung. Now, it is interesting in the flying star system, right? It's based on matching the Lo Shu number with the late heaven Bagua. Right, so the emphasis on Yung application. Right, now with Yun Hong Dagua, Right, what they do is they, they match the uh, late early heaven bagua with the low shu number. Right now. And it gets really confusing when you study the, the two systems in here. Now and that's because the Chinese want to express the different idea, right, between idealism and materialism, between yin and yang. It doesn't matter what kind of philosophy you study in the world, no matter what it is, whether it's east and west, north or south, somewhere it hits between idealism and materialism. And every time we do a consultation for our client, we need to be idealistic and practical at the same time. We've got to give meaning, right? But we've got to also make the place work for our client. And that's what the Chinese are trying to aim for when they use two modes of thinking. Right? Not only use two modes of thinking, right? They're trying to represent cyclical changes by using flying star. Right now. Flying star, the way the star flies, they are correlations. They don't literally fly that way. But we think actually going to fly that way. Not. It's a pattern language. It's a pattern language trying to develop. So, you know, the flying star is not only used in feng shui, but we also use it in Taoist ritual dancing, like the wine bowl, right? Because the Chinese. Um, uh, believe that uh, this diagram is a representation or correlation of the universe. Right? The even number or the yin number represents a square earth. You can see it in here, right? The yin number, oops, sorry. The yin number, right? Square earth. Okay? The yang number in the cardinal direction is a sphere representing the sphere sitting on the square earth. Right? So, Again, it's a pictorial orientation, it's a symbolism, okay? Now what's important is that the Chinese put the man in the middle, the five representing the man. The five represent the king, right? Because man, right? Man collect, connects heaven above and, heaven and earth below. Now, the problem is that we don't see the five yellow as some kind of correlation we see it as some kind of fear, right? The five yellow is a classic example. Every year, some of we look at the five yellow. Every time the five yellow comes up and it's like, ah, disaster. And five yellow with the two, the mother's gonna have cancer. <laughs> it's ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. Right? By counting the numbers in the low shoe, right? We can get an idea. 
what cycle it is. Right? Now, and because man is the one who lives on earth and under heaven, right? If we want to know how our environments are affecting us in a feng shui consultation, then we should always start and finish the human chi, right? With a feng shui brief in mind, we can start by observing and analyzing the tangible earth chi, that is the physical environment, right? Since they are physical, they are quantifiable, they are measurable, they are tangible, right? So let's start with something that we can get our hand on, something that's measurable, something that's visible, okay? Now, then we've correlated thinking. We can calibrate, we can calculate the intangible and the formless heaven chi before finding the in-between or the golden mean uh, or the zhong yong, right? That's based on human needs and the situation at the time. So it's very important. Yes, okay, it's very important we do this. Okay, so let's, let's go through this, right? So basically we have this cycle of doing a functional consultation, right? Um, China is not worried about there's 101 feng shui schools. They know that every feng shui school, no matter how different they are, and I'm talking about campus school, no matter how different they are, they work the same way, right? They work the same way, you know, like before when I started Sanhe, then flying, then Bai Jai, then Flying Star, now it's Qimen Dong Jia feng shui. Before that was Ba Ji feng shui. Every, every month or every year, there's something new, right? The thing is that the result has to be efficacious has to serve the people. That's what they're trying to say. And uh, so we go through a cycle of this. Uh, it's always involving a form and a compass school of feng shui, using a logical causal thinking as well the logical color uh, thinking, right? The key to its success is how to make the yin and yang of all sorts come together and have an intercourse. The Chinese actually use the word intercourse, right? So they can come alive and become sang qi, qi that encourage growth and sustain life. Now, this kind of fear that we have every year, right, is because people literally take the correlate thinking, right? They look at the, uh, they look at the, uh, sorry, they look at uh, a number, like the seven, and they have a pre-idea what a seven is going to be. It's broken army, it's going to be fighting, you know. They look at the five and say, oh, five is bad. Right? Uh, it's going to be disaster. They never look at the people and then they never look at the environment itself. They just, they just make, make these assumptions about this direction every year. And we get so scared. And then you know what? When you get scared, we're going to buy these little things and put in the corners there. Someone's made a packet. Because every year you have to buy something new. It's a scam. Anyway, I, got a, I was going to give you an example how this works, right? This house in here, if you're not careful, uh, you, would, you would interpret, right? This house is someone who have argument in the front door, right? And the mother and the youngest daughter's, uh, youngest son's going to fight and all these things. But in reality, this house is about a couple whose children grew up and they wonder how, how to reorganize the, the house. And nothing to do with the front door, with the man and the woman fighting, with loss of wealth, right? We read these things into it because we cannot distinguish between correlate thinking, causal thinking, thinking and observing. Right? In actual fact, the front door is really nice. The bad star would not exert its bad influence for a star. Right? So we need to, using a Sancho methodology, think about the heaven chi, earth chi, human chi, Think correlative thing, think causally to make it work. And we use this, we use this kind of thinking, right? Not to scare people, but we're using it as a creative process. We use this kind of thing to create a project like this. We're doing this right now in Berlin. I look at the flying star, I use the flying star, inspire me. We should put the front door in the back. We should make a lovely garden in the front because that's a reverse house, you know. Timely water go up wa mountain and timely mo uh, mountain go down water. Right. So, if you understand this idea, right, and uh, this idea of the uh, coming together and going apart,
between the uh, correlative thinking and uh, causal thinking, right, you will appreciate what we're actually doing in feng shui. Okay? Between the causal and the correlative, we can find the in between in the qi field, and the qi field does not mean some kind of energy or force field bound by the yin and yang that will fit in with each situation at hand and give us the efficacious outcome we should aim for all this in feng shui and not to use correlative thinking mix up with causal thinking and scare the shit out of our clan then try to say to you we can fix it for you it doesn't work like that you do this you become a charlatan because you're using fear to try to get some work that's not very virtuous thank you very much <laughs>